On April 20, 2010, the Deepwater Horizon disaster changed the lives of millions living near the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the scientists who responded to the crisis. These are some of their stories, intimate portraits of research, innovation, discovery. Welcome, I'm Jim McNamee, editor of Dispatches from the Gulf, a series of documentaries, short videos, and podcasts. Today we'll spend some time with Dr. Martin Grozel, professor of marine biology at the University of Miami. He's studying how the Deepwater Horizon oil spill affected one of the most important recreational and commercial fisheries in the Gulf. What he discovered was totally unexpected. We first caught up with Dr. Grozel while he and his research team were fishing in the Gulf Stream in search of mahi-mahi. Their goal was to replenish breeding stock necessary for the team's experiments. We cannot do the work without the rootstock. And uh, what we're looking for is, is basically young and old animals that are sexually mature, but not too big to handle. And the target is to collect one or two males, or bulls as we call them, and then a handful or perhaps more cows. We are now, I would say, maybe 15 miles offshore of Miami. We're probably in about 1,200 feet of water. This time again, we look for birds. Any excitement by birds here typically means that there's a school of mahi or other predatory fish that's pushing bait fish to the surface. We see birds that are kind of excited about something in an area. We'll run right up and, uh, and we'll start fishing that area. There's birds right ahead there. Suddenly, Grozel spots a small flock of gulls diving into a small school of bait fish. He and his team immediately cast out lines. They're gonna wind a little bit, get their head up. He's gonna kind of jump, jump them in. Okay, hold it. It doesn't take long before they catch enough mahi-mahi and head for home. During the trip back, Grozel explains his study. We've discovered a number of things that are somewhat alarming or concerning, uh, including uh, impaired swimming ability of these animals when they're exposed to very, very low concentrations of oil. So the big question is obviously what, what was the cumulative impact of these exposures on the early life stages and the adults where we see sub lethal effects on swim performance. As soon as they dock, the scientists transfer the mahi-mahi to a stress-free holding tank where they'll feed and spawn naturally while in captivity. The embryos and offspring will be used in a critically important study. One of the things that we're focusing on in particular is the ability of these animals to swim in sustained uh, high aerobic activity. Just a few steps from the spawning tanks is a high-tech laboratory where the mahi-mahi are tested for endurance. In here we have a swim tunnel, which is basically a treadmill for fish where we can also monitor uh, the metabolic rate while we're looking at their swim performance. The equivalent would be if you place me on a treadmill and you exhaust me or exercise me, my cardiac problems would manifest themselves in poor performance on this treadmill. We can do the exact same thing uh, with mahi-mahi and other fish species in the lab. The bottom line though is that mahi-mahi exposed to oil at certain concentrations during certain life stages are not able to swim as well as unexposed animals. And swimming performance uh, is critical, obviously, for capturing prey, therefore being able to ingest food, and also uh, critical for being able to avoid predation, avoid larger animals. But I think one of the critical things that we've learned from the work and that, that one of the things that we're following up on is that in addition to the obvious effects of mortality during exposure to high concentrations of oils, we have subtle effects that you cannot see with the naked eye. Today, thousands of scientists, oceanographers, chemists, engineers, biologists, are all working together to develop newer and better ways to understand and ease the impact of oil spills. To learn more about their work, visit our webpage at dispatchesfromthegulf.com. Funding for this podcast was provided by a grant by the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. And thanks for listening.